it, 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 you're sure. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. Don't. No. 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 Just in case. Just in case. Okay. Call for you. Well, good morning, guys. Good morning. Welcome to the bridge. We're glad you're here this morning. Beautiful day out there. Glad that you can make it to be with us this morning. I know there's lots going on. When the weather gets nicer, schedules start to fill up. I know that's true for me and my family, but this is an important time for us uh, to be able to get together when we do. You know, with the fire department schedule, I'm not always able to be here because of shift work, and some of you are like that as well. So when we get to be here, it's a special thing, and uh, glad we could be with you guys today. Hope you're looking forward to this as well. Uh, Got a few announcements before I jump into uh, a call to worship, and then we're going to have a moment of uh, corporate prayer for one of our members this morning. Um, but just want to share with you uh, two services. We got Easter coming up in a few weeks. Next week, Palm Sunday. The following week is Easter. Um, we're actually in a study in Acts right now, the book of Acts, and then that will uh, take a little pause while we go into Luke and look at the uh, Easter and Palm Sunday account. So that's coming up the next two weeks. I just want to remind you that uh, on Easter, we're going to have two services that we're offering just because of the capacity. It's hard to be able to socially distance. And even though some of those things are starting to change, we're still seeking to be precautious about those, those uh, issues. So Easter Sunday, we'll have two services and um, going to give you an opportunity to register for that. If you, if you want to attend those services, you need to register the same way we do here through that Eventbrite. Um, you can access that through our church website. And then there's also been a link that's been going out in the church email if you're getting that. But um, make sure that you register for one of those services on Easter Sunday. And then another exciting announcement to let you guys know, I mentioned the children last week and just them having to uh, be in here with us for, for such a long time, especially when the preacher's long-winded. And again, I'm up here today, guys, so... Man, I'm sorry, kids, but uh, it's different when we're downstairs and they get to hear me be long-winded because we can mix it in with activity and we can get up and run around, play games and do stuff, but uh, up here, it's a little bit different. If you want to get like that while we're singing and worshiping, that's fine, though. We're not going to stop you. Um, if you need to move around a little bit, do that. Um, I know I was doing that this morning as I was worshiping the Lord. I was shouting and, and moving around a little bit, so... I'm looking forward to doing that with you guys, but just want to remind you that April 11th is a big day for us because April 11th, that's the week after Easter, we're going to uh, restart our children's ministry. So we'll be able to, uh, that's going to be an exciting opportunity for families because while there's been many of you have been faithful to still gather in this space and your children have been patient with that, you've been patient with that, when we start again uh, in our children's ministry, we always love it because we get to see those children gathering here with us. And then they move out again with all the precautions. What that looks like, I don't know. Um, but that's what we're going to do starting April 11th and see how it goes. And then um, we'll move into the classrooms. But I just look forward to being able to have that one on, it's not one on one, but to have that small group time with our uh, children's teams working in that children's ministry. So already, church, begin praying for our children's ministry leaders. There's a, a children's ministry luncheon at the, the last Sunday in March. Um, and they're beginning to prepare their hearts and minds to lead our children in those ser in um, those children that children's ministry, which has been, I believe, an exceptional part of our church. So those who are partnering in that ministry are very important. And if one of you is feeling led, compelled uh, by God, prompted by His Holy Spirit to be involved more with our church, uh, that's a good area to get involved. There are background checks and things that uh, our church does for security and for uh, your well-being, for our children's well-being. But I would encourage you, if you're interested in that kind of thing, to begin that process of just ask. Come, come to me or anybody associated with the church, and how can I, how can I plug in with the children's ministry and uh, go through those hoops and uh, let God work in your life. I've said it before, and I'll say it again because it's important, that God works most in my life through the service that I give to Him. Like It's, it's in being with those children that God ministered to my heart during a really difficult time in my life uh, when my dad had died several years back. And that was very important to be able to gather with them and have them speaking in ways that I, I didn't even know God would speak in those opportunities. Um, so don't know what God's going to do in your life that way. But I want to remind you that that's coming, April 11th. So, And then uh, today we have a special uh, uh, just focus on uh, 
Restore Network. Um, want to let you know that, that's, that we, each month we have a mission partner uh, that we focus on. And, and when I say focus on them, we give highlight to them in our services, but then also our, our offerings, um, we seek to you know, give a little extra to that mission partner. A percentage of whatever you give in the offering basket goes to the, these mission partners that we highlight all the time throughout the year. And that's just set in our, in our budgeting. But then when we do the mission highlight, that mission month partner, we're actually giving, uh, you know, extra and above. And this, this, this month's mission partner that's highlighted is Restore Network. And I got to mention a little bit about them last week, but uh, there's a video that I'd like you to watch and then I'll come up and share a little bit more, okay? So. So we had been married a couple of years and wanted to start a family and um, we realized month after month that it was not happening and that it was harder than we thought to, um, to just get pregnant. It was months uh, that turned into years. As our infertility options were coming to an end, we started talking um, more seriously about adoption. At first, I know I was like, adoption, that's uh, not my first, it's not my plan A, it's not really my choice. I would, I would really rather do anything else. <laughs> it seemed really hard and it seemed really expensive and it seemed really complicated and long. Slowly, I began to realize, man, this is, God really is changing my heart. Like I, it wasn't my plan A, but God was making it my plan A. Like this became what I became really excited about. So it was February of 2014, and um, we started pursuing a domestic um, infant adoption, and we were waiting to be matched with a birth mom, and three days later, I found out I was pregnant. <laughs> Surprise. <laughs> So our adoption plans were put on hold and we welcomed our son Shiloh James into the world. After Shiloh was born, we now had this still um, changed heart because God really opened our hands to um, His will for our family in whatever form that could take. So that led us to foster care. The idea of not knowing um, how long we'd have a child, the idea of not knowing um, the circumstances and or just you know having a child for a time and having to watch them go, it just seemed like too much. So after Shiloh was born, we started talking about foster care again. It honestly, it wasn't any less scary, um, but I think just through everything we'd been through, our view of God was bigger and we trusted him. On February 9th of 2017, I was leaving work around 5 p.m. and got a call that there was a two-month-old baby in the hospital. Um, he was recovering from some abuse and he needed a safe home um, to go home to and by, by noon the next day I was picking him up in the car. Those first few days after we received Cedar into our home were honestly some of the hardest. We didn't know what the next day or even the next hour was gonna hold. I just remember God just kind of in the quiet saying, it's worth it. Every moment I made the choice to kind of step out of my comfort and to step out of the sphere and to hold him and to rock him and to sing him to sleep, even though I didn't know what tomorrow would look like or what the next year would look like, that it was making a profound impact that was shaping his entire life. Um, so it was just it was it was worth, worth it. it. <laughs> As time went on, um, that fear and that anxiety lifted and it just became easy and effortless. He was part of our family and we had um, another choice to make. God really showed us that loving loving this little boy didn't just mean loving him, but loving his family. And I just remember the Lord telling me to enter into a relationship with her and to be for her. And so I started 
taking Cedar um, once a week, driving two hours um, to meet her and um, for, for her to have a visit with him and I would stay and there were many weeks where it just felt really inconvenient and really hard and really stretching and out of my comfort zone and I'd just get really discouraged over it all and kept wondering like is this, um, is God gonna do anything here and is this really worth it? But what happened as I just kept going and kept sitting with her and um, just choosing to, to enter into her story. The separateness that had existed between between me and her, um, it just kind of vanished. And she has so many parts of her story, just like her little boy and just like us in our past that she had no control over. And really the only difference between us was some of those things that she had no control over. And um, I just, the Lord, um, just grew this deep compassion and love for her. Together we're just kind of navigating this future together, one where she'll get to know her son and watch him grow up and he'll get to know her and I just think the Lord's not only expanded this our family to include Cedar, but she's family now too. When I think of the word brother, um, I obviously think of um, my, I think of my biological brother. Um, and what I think is so beautiful to think about is the idea that our boys will have this greater definition of the concept of a brother. And that a brother is um, deeper than blood and a family is beyond walls of a house. It's um, used and sent by God and that's what we want our family to be. See, that's very precious, you know, the story of the Stam family and what God's doing in their lives and through them and those children's lives, uh, even in the lives of the mother, um, Cedar's mother. So the, just the, that's the first time I've seen the video um, to see that testimony. But those testimonies are recurrent in Restore Network. That is a, uh, my, you know, I don't want to spend too much time talking today, but my, one of my experiences was last time when the, uh, director of Restore Network came and spoke here. They said, look for ways to give outside of just giving uh, to the, the plate. But if you meet somebody in Restore Network, you know, that's a foster parent or something like that, give to them. And the next, I mean, that next week I'm getting my hair cut and uh, my, my hairstylist starts telling me a story about their little girl that they were fostering. And I'm like, oh yeah, where do you do that through? Restore Network, <laughs> you know? And it was like, so I really perked up. It was like, again, just like, okay. So, you know, I started praying with my wife. Like, how can we partner with them? How can we be an encouragement to them in this process? And um, just to be on that journey over the last year and hear those stories of how God was working in her life, um, to love and nurture that little girl is just a, a precious thing. And sometimes it's only for a season. But uh, the way God works, and that was said by, uh, I don't remember her name, but Mrs. Stam, she said, you know, that it's worth it, whatever that thing is, because that they're having a profound impact in their lives and they're having a profound impact on them as adults. So anyway, just to say there's a lot we could talk about with that. We can't do that all this morning. Just want to highlight them as a mission partner. And when you give today and you make a note or memo that this is for Restore Network, that money will be matched up to, I believe it's five hundred dollars by our church it, over the end of the month, whatever we get to. Uh, up to $500. So please consider giving as the Lord prompts you. And then also, um, there's more to come about Restore Network. Each year there's a banquet. Obviously, it looks a little different this year with COVID, but you have the opportunity to sign up for a virtual watch party and you can register for that. Um, the Kaufmans, Rich and Kathy Kaufman, are organizing a watch party actually banquet here at the church that up to 50 people can attend. There are a few, there's still a few slots left there. Don't feel selfish if you sign up for that. Like my wife and I tend to be like, well, we want to let somebody else. But guys, if you if you feel prompted to do this, sign up for it, because it's going to be a time of fellowship as well as encouragement, as well as vision casting for Restore Network. That's going to be on March 25th in our multipurpose room. And again, the precautions are being taken for social distancing, but it's going to be one of those nights where you still get some human interaction and fellowship over what Restore Network's doing. And we'll see and hear from them as well. Um, how we can continue to partner. So I want to encourage you, if you're interested in that watch party here live at the, or through the church with that group of 50, or if you're interested in doing that virtual online with your family, Rich and Kathy will be out in the back at the end of the service and just 
approach them and talk to them about it, okay? And uh, they're faithful. They'll have their masks on when you talk to them and stuff, so that's not, a, that's not an issue. But make sure that you uh, uh, catch up on that, find out more about that. And before I even move on, I just want to say a prayer for Restore Network, if that's all right with you. Father God, thank you that we gather and call upon your name, uh, Almighty God, Lord of Angel Armies. Father, we thank you that uh, when we call upon your name, you are always listening, that you are always attentive, that we don't have to make sure the signal comes through clearly, that we don't have to beg and plead, that you are listening as a devoted, gracious, heavenly Father. And Father, that is a picture and reminder to us as your children of what, what love looks like. Father, thank you for showing your love to us through your attentiveness to our needs, to our attentiveness, to our our burdens and desires. And right now, God, as you listen to us, we express a desire for Restore Network to thrive. That you would use this, this agency of people to create restoration in the lives of children and families. And God, we pray all this for the advancement of your kingdom, for the gospel of Jesus, for the restoration of souls through the name of Jesus. We pray in his name. Amen. So encourage you towards that and uh, exciting stuff. And I want to give you the call to worship. We start our service with a call to worship. And this morning it's going to be from Acts uh, chapter Acts chapter 5. And it actually comes from some of the verses we heard last week. Uh, at the end of the, the, the text from last week in Acts chapter 5, we've got verses 29 through 32. And this is Peter before that Jewish council. And he's been him and the other apostles have been put on trial. And this is what Peter says, verse 29. But Peter and the apostles answered, We must obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised Jesus, whom you killed by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him at his right hand as leader and savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses to these things. And so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. Today, we gather as witnesses to what Jesus has done in our lives, and we gather as witnesses through the Holy Spirit empowering us. You know, there's things going on this morning before any many of you have even walked in the doors or or got online to stream this service. God's been working in the hearts and lives of many of us. I know those things in my life started long ago as a young, young boy that God was doing in my life that lead to this moment today. And God's not done with me. It's still moving forward. We're going to get to talk about that today. But the call to worship is this. Are your eyes fixed on Jesus? Peter and the apostles, when they had the chance to talk about a plethora of issues with the Jewish council, and believe me, they could have argued a lot of things with these men. All they did was point to Jesus. All they did was talk about Jesus and why he came and how much he loved them. That's what we're called to do. focus on today is Jesus, why he came and how much he loves us. And in doing that, we proclaim his love to the world. Because how can we be loved and then not love others? And so this morning, the call to worship is just to fix our eyes on Jesus. As we sing together, as we pray together, as we receive his word together, that's all of us. Uh, The call to worship is for you to prepare your hearts to set your eyes on Jesus. Okay. And then as we lead into worship, we're going to sing together in just a moment. But I want to ask Prene, Prene, just come on up. And we're going to pray for Prene Sundas. Come on up, man. He's like, man, don't make me stand up there longer than I have to. And he has talked to me and said, I do not want to speak to this morning. I don't want to have to share anything, but you can just stand here by me. And uh, I've been vaccinated for all that's worth. But uh, uh, we want to pray with you. And so rather than have people gather around, um, we've got our worship team here on stage. But we're going to pray with you in just a moment. But Pranay has shared with us that he is, uh, he's been trying to get back to India for a while. He's also a part of one of our mission partners through HimServe. And uh, Pranay has a special uh, connection to a children's hostel there in India where he lives, and um, it's a great story that he's not sharing this morning, but those of you that know him know that story. He's been gracious to share those things with us. Pernay's leaving March 26th to go back. Things have kind of loosened up where he could go. Now, he's got to pass a coronavirus test, which, again, try to keep my distance for a moment until I pray, but he's, he's got to pass that test, and, and there's so many hoops he's got to go through, so we want to pray for him this morning as a church as that process goes through. Um, he's trusting the Lord in that. He's already had one opportunity to go, was suspended, and he's had to wait. So he's, he's just seeking to be faithful to the Lord as he's where he's at. 
But uh, Pernay's going back home to handle some family matters. He's got really important family matters that he shared with us. I won't get into all that today. Just very important and precious things for him and his family. And one concerning adoption, actually, with his daughter. So he's trying to finalize that. So there's some just really interesting things going on there. But then uh, also to go back and check in with the ministry there and how things are going. So I say all that to say, while he's one of our mission partners, his organization, Pranay himself is, uh, you know, at times been helped by our church. So there was an announcement that we were going to do like a special collection love offering, we called it. And he said, John, that, that, it's embarrassing a little bit, you know. And I said, I know, I know. I said, I think the word is just humbling, right? And him and I talked about what that means to be humbled by the church and things like being given money by the church. And I'm going to tell you, there's an eye surgery that his dad's having. He's going back for and it costs quite a quite a few dollars. And that that's something that's just not there for his family. So there's a need. But here's what I want you to understand is that I believe this speaks to Pernay and me as much as it speaks to, you know, anybody else, because how God works through you and how God works through me, it's all encouragement. God's trying to encourage us and how he moves our brothers and sisters to respond. So I just want to encourage you this morning. Uh, if you feel compelled to give to Pernay, you can uh, just if you have Obviously, however you give that, make sure you put some memo of Pranay Sundas on there or India. India is enough. He's representing the whole country today. Uh, you can just put India on there and they'll know that's to be designated for that offering. And our church is going to match, uh, you know, well, I'm not, I don't even think I'm supposed to say a certain thing like that. But just go ahead and uh, make sure that as the Lord prompts for you to give, you give. Okay. My family and I prayed about that and we're doing that this morning and. We're excited to support this guy because I've watched him and uh, he's been a part of our sermon prep team the last few months. And uh, he's been a part of my community group when we were able to meet. I was going to ask them to come up and pray with him, but we just don't. So many precautions. But anyway, I just want to say uh, this guy has represented a humility that has spoke to me. It spoke to me. And I wish I could ask him to pray for you guys because I love hearing him pray in his Nepal, Nepali language. Um, and every once in a while, there's a word in there that I could be like, amen, you know. But uh, I'm not going to do that this morning. Some of you have already done that with him, and you've been encouraged. Well, let's, this is our chance to encourage Pernay and his family, especially his family. I look forward to him being able to go home and say, this is what my church did for me, right? So, and uh, we're excited about that. So we're going to pray for Pernay that things, as they move forward, will keep you updated. But uh, March 26th, he's on a plane. His wife, Robin, couldn't be here today, but we want to make sure that we're remembering her as well. She's a part of our community group, and we got, we got to keep checking in on Robin. That's, he said he's leaving his heart behind, right, as he goes over there. So his, you know, they've been married for a little over a year. Is that right? All right, making you talk. There you go. So two years. It's going to be two years. So uh, that's important, so we're praying for her too, okay, even though she's not here with us. But we've done this before. Just going to ask you just uh, to agree. If, if you agree in this prayer for... Uh, for Pernay, I'm just going to ask you to just bow your heads, pray with me. But if you just want to extend an arm just to let us know that you're praying and you agree with this prayer, that helps as well. Okay, let's pray. Heavenly Father, again, we just call on you and your great name. And we thank you that uh, you are over all things and you are sovereign, Lord. Father, you have showed your goodness and your faithfulness through your son, Jesus. And I pray that that would be Strong encouragement for Pernay as he moves from this stage and into the world that you called him. And God, I just thank you for the time that we've had with him. I look forward to more time to come, but I do pray for him in his journey. I pray that you would keep him safe from harm, that you would watch over him as he goes through the hoops of testing and processes that he has to pass through to go back home to his, to his family. And I just pray that you would help him in that, that you would let him see you drawing near to him through it all. And God, one of the ways you give an opportunity to do that is through our church. And I thank you that already you have humbled him by the way that our church has responded in love towards him. But God, you have also humbled us in the way that he has responded in love towards us. And we are thankful for that reciprocal relationship you give us as a family of God. And so we pray today for Pernay and Robin that you would bless them in this experience that it would just be one more opportunity to act as an ambassador for you and what you're doing in their lives and increasing their faith in Jesus, to trust you more and the worldly securities less and less. 
So God, we ask that you would help him in the things that he's going home to um, attend to, that you would just help with his father's surgery and, 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 and his finalizing things with this adoption of his brother's daughter to be his daughter. I just pray that you would just help him in these things in the distance with Robin and him, Father. There's so much that I just want to pray earnestly, God, and commit to you, but words are not enough this morning. You know what he needs, and I find great comfort and peace in that. My brother goes with you, God. Help us to pray for him as you bring him to mind, and then act as you prompt in our hearts to do so. And God, again, let Prene be encouraged this morning by the good news about Jesus and how you stick closer to a brother than a brother always and forever. And thank you for what you're doing in his life through Jesus. We pray these things for your glory, for your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, brother. All right. So I was going for the record for the longest opening call to worship. And uh, thanks for helping me out with that, man. Getting in the record books. But uh, we're going to sing together. So I invite you to stand. Welcome one another from where you're at. And we're going to sing together.
the Holy Spirit brought to mind the passage in James that talks about um, how powerful the tongue is and how with um, our tongue, we bless our Lord and Father, but we also curse our brother who's made in our image and how that shouldn't be so. Um, and so we just wanted to give a minute this morning for a little bit of personal prayer and confession before we continue in worship um, so that you can lay those things that might be in your heart before him and then we'll pray together. We come before you humbly and contrite, knowing that we are a sinful people, but you are a great God. You're a great God who loved us so much. These children that you've made in your image, that you provided a way for us to be saved, for us to be made whole and restored, and to have a right relationship with you. God, I just pray that you would mend every heart that is broken, um, that you would just draw us close to yourself this morning, that you would help us not to be overwhelmed by our sin, but knowing that once we brought it to you and confessed it, that it's removed from us, Lord, and that we can continue to worship you um, with joy and gladness in our hearts because you have saved us for the honor and glory of your name. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.
worship, let's consider these words of Paul's from Philippians 2. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. And your relationships with one another have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. your son is lifted high, would you pour out your spirit upon us? Would you hide John behind your cross as he brings your word? And as we hear your word preached, would you move in our hearts for your glory? Amen. Be seated. You know, I've grown up in the church over the years, I've seen revival services and I've been a part of that kind of language and people saying, oh, we need a revival in our church. Uh, man, fix your eyes on Jesus and that's a revival for our hearts. Uh, I've heard people even say in the last few weeks as we've been in Acts, like, we need a revival in our nation. Uh, yeah, but it starts with you and it starts with me. And I know right now God's doing a revival in my heart through Jesus all the time. So pray that for you, church. I pray that for uh, all of us, that we are experiencing a revival through Christ. Um, our passage this week deals with persecution in the church. We, we just came from last week where we saw 
uh, the apostles again before the Jewish council. I just read some of Peter's words. And then we move into this week and we see the, the council's response to what they just uh, heard from Peter and the apostles. And they experienced heavy persecution. And it begins to be a problem for the church going from here on through Acts. And this starts to raise a question for people uh, in the church, for people who are Christians, like, you know, why persecution? Why would God allow that kind of suffering on His people? And I just want to say it again, that God is the only one worthy of our worship. And He has revealed Himself to us through Jesus. Some people say, well, John, you talk a lot about Jesus because that's what this Bible, this Word from God that's been proven over the centuries. This Word has been proven and it says that Jesus is the revelation of God to you and me. That He is the fullness of God and man. That He shows us what it's like to even be a human being. And so all these things are fulfilled in Christ and wow, we could just spend time talking about that there. But the passage today is dealing with persecution. And why does God allow that to happen to Christians? And it still goes on in the world today. Although, let me say this, the gospel is offensive. Now you're like, well, wait a second. You came in here this morning, many of you were in agreement. And you're saying amen to a lot of things that are, are being said and sung and prayed. But that's for those who've had a regenerated heart. That's for those who have come to understand that our sin is the enemy and that our Savior is our friend. But for many in the world, and sometimes our own hearts, still turn in rebellion against God and say, sin is my friend, and the Savior that you proclaim is the enemy of my sin. And while they're right that our Savior is the enemy of that sin, He's not the enemy of them. He's not the enemy of you. He came to save you because He loves you. He came to save me because He loves me. And that's the message that we want to talk about and proclaim. That's the message that Peter and the apostles were presenting to the Jewish council. Yes, this happened. You hung him on a tree. But note what God did. But God pointed him to be leader and savior for the repentance of your sins and the forgiveness of your sins. And so God is doing something bigger. So I've said it time and time again that God is the only one worthy of our worship, but guess what? There's a competition going on every day that storms our hearts. Storms our hearts. And what that is, is there's all these idols that are competing for our attention. Now, these idols in themselves don't necessarily have breath and life in them, but some way our sin begins to propagate this idea that these idols will somehow serve us better than God does. So why is the gospel an offense to someone who is walking in idolatry? Why is the gospel an offense if you attack my most precious and valued things that are sinful in me? Because I'm still looking at those things as nourishment. I'm still looking at those things as something that can give me life. And you know what Jesus in His grace does? He shines a light on those idols and He reveals how ugly and destructive they are. You say, man, that just makes me feel guilty. No, Jesus is trying to show you that that's death and that's destruction. And he invites you to life more abundantly in himself. The gospel is offensive because it begins to crush our idols. It speaks against in opposition to our idols. It says that your idolatry is actually wrongheaded. You're going in the wrong direction. The gospel reminds us that there's only life found in God's plan for us. The one who created us knows us the best and he has made the way for us to walk away from our sin and walk with Him. So the gospel is an offense to anyone who is not in agreement and cooperation with that. And it can be an offense to you and me today. But I want to make that clear this morning as we go into this passage that so many times persecution does still come in the world, but there was a reason why it came here. Because God wanted to show that His gospel was worth it. I didn't even know the Stam family was going to keep repeating that phrase it was worth it. But that's the thing about persecution is it shows what's really worth it. That's the problem in the comfortable church today. And comfort can be an idol. It's a problem in my life many times. Probably in yours too. But that's a problem in the comfortable church today that we would begin to think, I, I just want to do anything that just helps us go along to get along. And I don't want to say anything that would be offensive, even if it's the Word of God. 
You see, the gospel reconciles those things that are hard for the world to reconcile as God transforms our hearts through his, a relationship with Jesus Christ. You see, it doesn't get easy when we submit to God's word. But what it does do is it changes us and leads us more to depend on Jesus Christ. And what that does is that points the world to the perfect one and the perfect Savior. And so there is this massive storm that's going on in our hearts, competing for our attention, competing for our worship. Some of you were around a few years back and there was this term that was used often in the church called worship wars. Anybody here remember that term? I don't remember it fondly. And what it basically boiled down to was a lot of talk about how style of music should be or what the preaching should look like or how, the, how we should dress. There was all these different things and it was based on style. I've always liked that about our churches that uh, there's a lot of different styles. Why do I like that? Because we make idols all the time out of styles. We make idols all the time out of different ways and means that the gospel is proclaimed. And the important thing is that the gospel is proclaimed. And so when I think of worship wars, the church itself is guilty. This morning the word came to me, cavalcade. And I asked my wife, you know, can you, can, we were trying to figure out what, what does cavalcade mean? And it means like a procession, like a, a like a, procession, like, kind of like a military procession, but I was thinking cavalcade of idols. And you know where I thought of? I didn't think of the bar down the street or the strip club down the road. I didn't think of those things. You know what I thought of when I thought of a cavalcade of idols? I thought of the American church. Does that hit you in the center of the forehead? Because it hits me in the center of the forehead. God, we need a revival in our land. Well, we need to repent of our idolatry. We need to fix our eyes on Jesus. And the revival comes in me and you, and it begins to move like it did in Acts, like a fire. There's a cavalcade of idolatry, even in the church today. You came here this morning, I came here this morning, and already idols were beginning to work in our lives thinking, I need this to happen. I would like it if this was available. I know when I was a kid growing up, they'd say, yeah, it's the, it's the, it's the person who's complaining about it's too cold in here. It's too hot in here. Somebody needs, you know, we, we need to get a new air conditioner. We need, and it was always things like that. Or the carpet just isn't the right color for me to be able to focus. It steals my attention or whatever that thing is. And I used to think that was so silly because that wasn't me. I was like, I don't care how hot or cold it is. I was going to be hot all the time because I'm always running around. So as a kid, I didn't care. And I thought they were crazy. But now as I'm older, I realize, you know what? I got more idols than they got. Those, those examples they used when I was a kid, I'm guilty of all that. Because it just takes the least little thing, and I start putting my attention on that thing is, you know what, if that was right, then I would be right. If that thing was good, then I would act good. I would be happy. I'd be in the right mind. And you know what, when somebody preaches the gospel to that, it's offensive. You're telling me my opinion doesn't matter, and that's offensive, right? Right? So, guys, persecution comes because the gospel offends. And I say all that to say we are living in a time, just like they did, where we could choose to use our conversations to talk about a whole host of things. To use our, our relational leverage to talk about anything and everything trivial. And, guys, we're making the mistake of jumping into those things. I'm doing it too. Jumping into things that are trivial, meaningless, and in the end, they're just more idols. And the gospel calls us to present the good news about Jesus. So that's a word for you. That's a word for me this morning as the American church. Thankful that I'm part of a church in America. But just understand that where I am for such a time as this, God's calling me to have my idols crushed and fix my eyes on Him so that He can lead us in the way that's everlasting, so that he can lead us in the way that is righteous, so that he can lead us in the way that he wants for his kingdom and to represent him as his ambassadors. And I say all that because we still have persecution going on today, but I'm really weary when people come to me and say, yeah, over here in this country and over here in this country, we got persecution going on. And this is an example. And we don't see that here at all. And I don't understand. I don't know about you. I've experienced persecution. Christians, if you share the gospel, you're going to experience persecution. 
Now, what we see going on here is persecution that, you know, it, it, it really reveals itself, it begins to reveal itself at very serious levels, you know. We're talking about imprisonment, we're talking about torture, we're talking about death that eventually is going to happen, we're going to see rejection, exile, all these things begin to happen. And some of us experience those things in certain levels, but maybe definitely, like I'm still standing here, and I've never been in prison for preaching the gospel, thank God. But what I want you to understand is sometimes... That's at the sake of the gospel, because I can get so comfortable in the way that things are that I might start pointing to my idols instead of pointing to Jesus. And persecution is like that heat lamp. It's like that thing in our lives. It's like refining what is really worth it. And the more that I'm persecuted, the more that I suffer, the more the stuff that's worth it rises to the top. And that's what we see happen with the apostles. They're not speaking about trivial things. They're not getting caught up in uh, uh, just standing in the council to uh, offend religious rulers. They're just proclaiming Jesus, and the offense is coming strictly on a spiritual level because of the, the offense that the gospel presents. So let's read it together. Uh, Acts chapter 5, and we're going to be there. Acts chapter 5 and verse 33, and we'll go through uh, 42. Acts chapter 5, verses 33 through 42. When they heard this, they were enraged and wanted to kill them. But a Pharisee in the council named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law held in honor by all the people, stood up and gave orders to put the men outside for a little while. And he said to them, Men of Israel, take care what you're about to do with these men. But for before these days, Theudas rose up, claiming to be somebody, and a number of men, about 400, joined him. He was killed. And all who followed him were dispersed and came to nothing. After him, Judas the Galilean rose up in the days of the census and drew away some of the people after him. He too perished, and all who followed him were scattered. So in the present case, I tell you, keep away from these men and let them alone. For if this plan or this undertaking is of man, it will fail. But if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them. You might even be found opposing God. So they took his advice. And when they had called in the apostles, they beat them. And they charged them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. Then they left the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. And every day in the temple and from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching that the Christ is Jesus. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the chance to gather this morning and to be encouraged by your word and your Holy Spirit. Thank you for the ways that you're working in your church today through your son Jesus. Thank you for the ways that the gospel transforms our hearts and minds and sets us free from our idols and leads us to life everlasting in your son. Father, we celebrate that today. It's a reason to rejoice. Even in the midst of great suffering that many in our church have experienced suffering over the years as I've walked with them, and you have brought rejoicing in the midst of suffering and grief because of what you're doing through your Son and the hope that you bring through, your, through Jesus Christ. Father, help us today to fix our eyes on Jesus and to see him as our Messiah today. Amen. So persecution's happening. These guys are about to be killed. When the Sadducees hear what Peter and the apostles have to, to say to them, we read it in the call to worship, it says they were enraged and they wanted to kill them. Now it's interesting, the response is not, hey, you know, let's banish them. Let's, what? It's, hey, let's just kill them. Let's give them the death penalty. And we're going to see that actually play out later on, right? Where that's actually affirmed by the, by the, the Jewish religious rulers um, to put these people to death, to put them in jail and shut them down for what they're saying. But at this point, there's still some other avenues. And you got this guy who rises up, Gamaliel, and he's a Pharisee. And uh, we're told later he was actually... Uh, one who was uh, the, the, the master over Paul, right? Paul was his pupil, and so Gamaliel was his teacher. 
And he was a well-respected man. It says he's held in honor by all the people. And he stands up and he gives these orders for the apostles to be put outside for a little while. So he's a man of clout, right? If he tells them to do something, they're doing it. And then something to note is that the Pharisees in this council, they're, they're, not, they're not the top of the hierarchy, right? The Sadducees run this thing, but the Pharisees have some say. And Gamaliel speaks up and he says, hey, men of Israel. And I think it's interesting that he calls them again, refers to them as their title, men of Israel, because who did Jesus come to save? Israel. So it's almost like, again, for me, last week's text, and this is all happening at the same time, that these men would hear him say, men of Israel, and remember the apostles' message about the gospel. You never know how what you say and the seeds that you plant, the Holy Spirit brings it back into somebody's mind later on. But it doesn't go on to tell us any of these things. It just says he refers to them as men of Israel, and he goes, take care, and we read this. But he brings up a couple examples, Theudas and Judas. And in both those examples, he says, hey, these guys rose up. They took some people with them. They shared their crazy philosophies. And guess what happened to them? They were killed or they died and their people scattered. Their people, you know, it wasn't an issue. It, it played itself out, right? And what does Gamaliel say? If it's God's will, you can't stop it anyway. And rather than mess with these guys, let's let it play out like that. And, and in looking at the, this text this week, there was times that I was like, okay, this guy may just, it, it, he's so godly, he gets it. <laughs> But then later on, I'm like, you know what? He's actually crazy smart like a fox. I really think he thought, let these guys go and the people will kill them. Why do I say that? And I don't know what happens in Gamaliel's life later on. I don't know, just like Paul. I don't know what happens as far as salvation. But what I do know is how the world works today. Some sense of it from John Davis's perspective. And what I see in the world today is the same type of thing, where if the gospel is offensive to me, I'm looking around to see how, what other voices can rise up and squelch this. And so we're not told why he uses these examples, but he does give them, and he does say that they should let them alone, that if it's meant to be, it'll be. If not, then so be it. And uh, something that stood out to me was, you've got him mentioning Theudas and Judas, both of them perished. What's the difference here? The apostles are proclaiming who? Who are they following? Jesus. What do we know about Jesus? He's the resurrected Christ. That at this moment, right now, in the story, Jesus is resurrected. Jesus has walked on the earth for 40 days before ascending into heaven. It is indisputable proof. And, and, and I told you last week, they're not even arguing about the facts about Jesus. They're just arguing about the movement that's starting to happen. And I really even believe Gamaliel, as a Pharisee, you can look into all this. This is all background stuff. But the Pharisees actually had a vested interest to let this conversation play out a little bit because it's talking about resurrection. It's talking about a coming Messiah. You see, Gamaliel still believed there was a Messiah that was to come. The Sadducees didn't believe in it. So there's still some vested interest for him to be like, hey, let's have this conversation a little bit longer. But not because necessarily he's awaiting Jesus as his Messiah. But he was looking for the Messiah. And I hope he found him. But once you understand is these two examples, Theudas and Judas, both perish, but there's Jesus. He's the one who still lives. And in this moment right here, he's resurrected. And so what they all took for granted was that this movement would not die. These people would not just scatter and shut up. That they were going to continue to give witness, as we read in our call to worship, to what they've experienced and seen. They can't help but do it. Now, let me ask you this. If this is a made-up story, if this is fake, if this is anything that the apostles could recant and say, you know what, maybe it didn't happen. Change our minds. Let's figure out a new narrative. We've been brainwashed. I don't know. Whatever it is. And they figure that out. Don't you think 39, don't you think 40 lashes with a whip would have washed it out of them? Now, John, why are you being so graphic? Why are you saying things that way? Because I want you to see why persecution's happening right here in Acts. Because your God loves you so much. He loves me so much that he wants us to know. This message is so true that the people who are carrying it, mere mortals like you and me, couldn't help but share, even in the midst of beatings, even in the midst of killings, even in the midst of death itself, they still had to proclaim Jesus is the Messiah. We've seen him raised from the dead. We've seen him work his wonders. We've seen his words and his promises continue to come true. And we've experienced the baptism of his Holy Spirit. 
And all of this is irrefutable because now you're seeing those things through us as a church. And what I want you to understand is that the enemy, the enemy is going to rise up at that point and try to shut that down. And persecution, all it does is actually work in God's favor to say, you know what? It's worth it. It's worth it. And Christians keep saying, you know what? It's worth it. And how do we know that? Because jump to the end. Jump to the end of this passage. You see what happens with the apostles in verse 41. They've just experienced this persecution, this beating that you and I, I think, would succumb to. And in 41, it says, then they left the presence of the council. Rejoicing. That's the word you need to know. Rejoicing. Rejoicing that they had been counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. Guess what their statement was? It was worth it. It was worth it. It was worth it for Jesus. And guys, we have the luxury of looking through the New Testament letters to the church, and we get to see all that the apostles wrote. And time and time again, we see Peter, we see Paul writing how these present sufferings are just a light momentary affliction in comparison to the eternal glory we have in Christ Jesus. Last week, I talked about treasure in jars of clay and how you and me carry this treasure of Christ in us in jars of clay. Why is that important to me? Because this jar of clay is weak. Your jar of clay is weak and it's breaking all the time. But when it breaks, guess what? It's, a, it's another opportunity to share Jesus. When it breaks, it's another opportunity to say, this is why I look to him. This is why I need him. And it's another opportunity to call me back to him, right? So we have this treasure in jars of clay. But if you look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4, what it says is that we are crushed, we are beaten, we are perplexed. It goes on to all this list of stuff that happens to us as human beings, as followers of Jesus Christ. And it says all these things happen to reveal the eternal glory of Christ Jesus in us. Romans chapter 8, I pointed to that a few weeks ago, and I said, guys, if there's a passage of Scripture that you need to meditate on, well, you need it all. But meditate on Romans chapter 8, church, American church, my, my culture of church, because there's a lot of different American church cultures. But the culture I've been in needs to meditate on Romans chapter 8. Because in there it talks about persecution. And it talks about suffering. And you know what it says in Romans chapter 8? Well, guess what? I'm going to read it. It was going to be the call to worship, but instead we're going to read it here. Romans chapter 8. Verse 12, I'm going to read through 19. So then, brothers, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are God's, that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs. And listen to the heirs. Listen to the inheritance. Heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. That gets left out sometimes in the gospel today. It's important for us, and I'll explain why in just a moment. Verse 18, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. I guess I really don't have to explain it if you're following along in your Bible, because guess what it says? It's there to reveal the glory of God in us. Suffering comes, guys. We don't have to create it. I had a conversation this week, and I was so worried that that young man was going to go hurt himself because he just wants to experience God and the gospel and the way we're talking. I was like, you don't have to create this. It just happens. This isn't man. We don't, we don't go out and try to like inflict beatings on ourselves. We don't try to go out and get ourselves in trouble. We just serve Jesus step by step, and guess what? Suffering happens. I can look around. I'm already seeing faces where I'm like, I remember suffering with you. I remember suffering with you. I remember seeing suffering in you. And I remember how Jesus spoke the last word and how he's still speaking the better word. Suffering reveals the content and substance of what we believe. Last week, I... I shared about some of the struggles that I was having, 
just in that week and the grace of God in them. Talked about relationships, career. Talked about living as a broken man in a broken world. How death is constantly knocking at my door and the things I'm involved with. But I want you to hear this. Those are all experiences for you and me that flesh out the genuineness of our hope. They're not wasted if you and I don't waste them. You know when they're wasted, those opportunities, when our idols start to get to say, when all of a sudden I'm saying, you know what, I'd rather be comfortable. I'm just going to self-medicate. You know what, I'd rather be comfortable. I'm just going to retreat away from that prompting of the Holy Spirit to be over here at this time. You know what, I just want to be comfortable, so I'm not going to make myself vulnerable and stand in that pulpit today. And again, this is not just for a pastor or a preacher. This is for each of us as ministers of the gospel, how he works through his new covenant in Christ in our hearts. How are you bending to your idols? You see, it's the heat, it's the suffering, it's the struggles, it's the trials of life that are revealing the content of what you really hope in and believe. Guys, we have a world that's hungry for that hope. And before we go talking about the world, you're hungry for that hope in Christ. Is what you are hoping in unshakable? There's only one thing that's unshakable in this world, and that's Jesus Christ. So while last week I shared about those struggles, it's just a reminder that God is trying to weed out what is the object of my faith? Is it a something or somebody that's worth beholding? And Jesus proves himself worthy every time. I mean, who's really looking for a religion of convenience when the stuff hits the fan in their lives. Did you hear what I said? Who's really looking for a religion of convenience when the stuff really hits the fan in their lives? You see, it might make us feel good about ourselves to think, you know what, I did this, I did that. It's helping me be a better person. But when the stuff really hits the fan, we start asking the real questions of why, God? How could this happen, God? Where are you, God? And we need a greater hope than any worldly security offers. What our souls really long for most is that unshakable hope that is a rock-solid assurance for those that trust in Jesus as Christ. Because He has done it, will do it, you can bank on it. March Madness is going on right now, and uh, I was raised in athletic culture. My dad was a competitive guy. I got kids that are athletic, and I've enjoyed those things over the years still enjoy March Madness is just a fun time. I haven't even watched much college basketball, but I just like watching it now because I pick a bracket and all of a sudden I care who I picked on the bracket. (laughs) All of a sudden I want to be able to say I picked the right guy. I picked the right team. But I was watching the other day and I was just thinking about some of these things and I was thinking, you know, with Christians, it's like March Madness all the time because those idols are always competing. They're always trying to win like, hey, maybe we're going to get there. Maybe we're going to be the champion in John's life today. And at the end of it, Jesus stands alone, undisputed. We talked about that. He's undisputed. Nobody can lick him. He's there forever. It's whether or not I want to accept that truth and live in the joy of knowing and hoping in him. But the reason I bring up March Madness is because it made me think about how many times uh, in, in sports we've said to our players, hey, pay attention to the scoreboard. You know, when that other team is picking on you and they're trying to give you these little ticky tack things and trying to get you to engage, Scoreboard, you know? And you try to get them to understand that about pointing to the scoreboard without being ticky-tack themselves, right? But I want you to understand that's the way it is in the Christian faith. The enemy comes with his insults, with his condemnation. He comes with all these things. And you know what you and I are supposed to remember? They say, scoreboard. And then you know what we're supposed to remember when we say that to Satan? Scoreboard? Hey, John, scoreboard. Because guess what happens when I look at the scoreboard? And I know it's saying the scoreboard, but just imagine. When I look at the scoreboard, I remember Jesus. There's that cross again. When I look at the scoreboard, I remember Jesus. What he did, what he's doing, what he promises to do. And I know, doesn't matter what it looks like right now, that I'm more than a conqueror in Christ. It goes on in Romans chapter 8 to say this. In verse 31, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son. Listen to that. God himself did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? 
It is God who justifies. Now, again, I'm reading this in the face of persecution. We're talking about persecution, folks. This isn't just for warm, fuzzy feelings on a weekday. This is to deal with the pressures and trials and struggles of life. Verse 34, who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised? Who is at the right hand of God? That's a position of authority. Who indeed is interceding for us? And he goes on to say, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I'm sure that neither death nor life nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. How do Peter and the apostles rejoice in the face of persecution in the aftermath of beatings, severe beatings? They rejoice because they know it's worth it. To proclaim Jesus' name is worth it. How do we, in the face of trials and suffering and struggles and all that this broken world brings to us as broken people, how do we continue to pray in faith in Jesus' name? How do we continue to follow Jesus? How do we continue to trust His Word and the promptings of His Holy Spirit? Because we've come to believe that He's worth it. Last week I said, what kind of witness is it if every time somebody asks about Jesus, I say, you know what, I started out eight years old and I've just been getting better ever since. Remember, I kind of walked through that, maybe if you were here. But today, I just want to remind you a little bit more, expound on that. What happens with that? It's not that I'm saying I get worse. It's not saying that I'm giving license to my sin. It's saying, instead of saying I'm getting better and acting like I'm somebody, start talking about Jesus getting better to me and how he's revealed to me that he is somebody to behold. And he's convinced me more than ever. You don't have to tell me after 26 years of marriage and longer being with my wife, you don't have to remind me that I need to look at her. I want to look at her. And it's the same way in a greater way with Jesus that because he's so much better than any idol I've ever seen, all I need is a reminder from the Holy Spirit and my eyes fixed back on him. Is that what you're experiencing with Jesus today? That's what happens when we follow and know and walk with Jesus. He becomes better. And guess what? The world is longing for that kind of Savior and that kind of hope. They need to know it. They need to see it being shared through us. And so today, I got all kinds of notes here, but I want to share one last thing leading into a, our invitation song that we are more than conquerors. I was asked this week by Stephen in a men's Bible study Tuesday morning. He said, what's something that you just saw God do and you knew because it was him, he was going to do it and nothing was going to stand against it. And he said, and in what ways did it encourage you? Man, it's been about 10 years ago. My wife and I went on a venture here believing we were going to be part of a church plant, Restoration Church. And I've shared this before. That church didn't come to fruition. That church ended up disbanding after a year and a half, January of 2013. That's starting to sound like a familiar year to you guys. 2013 is the year this church began to launch its meetings. We've just celebrated an anniversary this week of the first core group meeting, I believe. I wasn't a part of that, but uh, this is what I want to tell you. God was working. We've had that conversation. What I want you to hear, though, is this. My son prayed a prayer as we disbanded. Christians there got to pray, and he prayed and he said, God, help us not to see this as a failure because of all that you've done in our lives through it. And he was eight years old. Praise that prayer. So we're in the meantime, we, we don't know where we're going to be involved or plugged in. So we go back to the church that we were at, Christway Church, and we continue with them. They're the ones that have been praying for us along the journey. So we continue with them. But we're really like not sure what this looks like. Felt like, you know, we're kind of stepping backwards, right? But those are the people that knew us and loved us. So we went there. And then while we're there, I kind of feel like you're sitting on your hands. My son walks down an aisle and says that he knows he needs to be baptized as a Christian. He's never been baptized at that point. So we have a conversation about that. And, I, and, and when my son walked down the aisle, another little girl followed him, not about his age. 
And she, anyway, long story short, they ended up getting baptized there at that church. And it was around the same time we actually knew we had visited the bridge and talked to Steve and all this stuff was happening. We were like, we feel like we're supposed to be a part of the bridge. That's what God's doing in our family. And so we come along beside the bridge, but we told Christ, we feel like he needs to be baptized there. He knows you guys. We hadn't got to know a lot of people there. So I got to baptize my son there. I got to baptize my son there. Why are you saying this, John? What's this got to do with anything today? Well, I want to tell you, there's a church coming to Alton with part of the core group that was with us called Requiem. Not trying to get anybody to go there. Obviously, you're my church family. And I love you and how God works in your life with us together is important, but how he sends us is important too. But we're a church that wants to partner with new church plants. And, and Steve and I are scheduled to meet with my friend Vince this week. But here's what I want to tell you. God is not done with that story. He's continued it. They're moving here. If you're like, well, it might be a pipe dream, John. They're, they've already bought a house. They're already moving. I think they're neighbors with Elise Durham, and I'm worried about it because of it. You know, I know Vince. <laughs> He's a crazy guy. But I love him. And they're going to be neighbors out there with Elise Durham. And they've already bought the house, and they've got eight people who are already moving to Alton with them from August Gate Church. And so there's this, this work that God's doing in them that I'm excited. I, I shared that with another young man this week and said, I think you need to get involved with me. So I just want you to hear this, that God's working in those ways. Now, you say, what's that got to do with that story about your son? Because if my faith and his faith is just based on a decision he made when he's eight years old, it's weak. Jesus saved him. Jesus saved me. Jesus doesn't stop saving us. He keeps saving us. And it's these parts of the story that go on. You see, he's on his way as a 16-year-old man. He's, he's on his way, and so are you. But the thing is, is that God's still working in our story to increase our faith. And when struggles come, when struggles come, guess what? I'm still speaking to him about how God's working in my life. When I'm hard-pressed on every side, when I'm being crushed, like the struggles I shared last week, or start, some of those things are happening, he's looking to see how does this play out in Dad. The great, again, the story's not done. With my dad, a few years back, you see, I talk about his death, but you didn't see his suffering at the end and shriveling up to a skeleton as he's dying. And the man's faith was unshakable in Christ. He used every last minute to talk about Jesus. And guys, that's still speaking to me. And what I'm trying to tell you is our suffering is still speaking to other people around us. It's not done. When the disciples are done at the end of this passage, they're not done, but when we get to the end of this passage, what does it say? They continued preaching in the temple and teaching in their homes. So I want you to hear this, Christian. This is the point for today. If you're a Christian, you're called to preach in public. You're called to share the gospel about Jesus with people you don't even know and with people you know, but preach it in public. When they say, what is that about? You say, it's Jesus. And then the other thing is, it's something that's personal and it gets taught in our homes. It gets taught in those intimate settings. Guys, if you're a Christian, that's how this thing plays out. We're still being revived. We're still on fire. The church hasn't stopped. Question is, are you looking to an idol? Are you looking to Jesus? And that's the invitation today. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Let's pray. God, thank you for the ways that you worked in my heart. Thank you for the ways you worked in my son and my family over the years. I thank you for the ways you're working through this church requiem. I thank you for the ways that you've worked in my father's life. I thank you for the ways that you've worked in my spiritual family here at the bridge as I look around and I'm encouraged by testimonies that no one is able to give this morning. But simply looking at their faces, I remember all that you've done. And I give you full praise and glory. Father, to know that the resurrected Christ is resurrecting me. That in your name is the victory. That I sing those things this morning. And I recognize that all praise is due to Jesus. Father, I pray that for my brothers and sisters here this morning who are watching online as they prepare for a March Madness tournament, whatever that thing is that their minds and hearts are moving towards right now, that they would fix their eyes on you as the one who is worthy of worship, that I would fix my eyes on you as the one who is worthy of worship. You see, we can't get in the way of Jesus. You're too magnificent. So reveal your glory to us. As we suffer, God, I pray for my hurting brothers and sisters around the world and here that you would gird them in prayer and spiritual armor to stand up under the attacks of the enemy. And God, for the purpose of proclaiming Jesus as the Messiah. We pray this for your glory and by the power of your name. Amen.
our God, our conqueror, that's Jesus. Today we fix our eyes on Him. And as I shared last week about children, God's put these voices in your life to speak, give them attention, you know, their grace from God. And that's the same for us all as spiritual children. Jesus is speaking through His Holy Spirit. 
And he wants us to hear his voice, which leads to truth and to life, abundant life in him. Um, Guys, trials are going to come for all of us. And one thing I want you to know, God wants you to know, is that each of you and your role in the kingdom is important. And when I tell that story about me and my dad and my son and my church, I want you to know there's no role that God is calling you to that's too insignificant. Because your role, your obedience to the promptings of the Holy Spirit is leading to someone else's faith and encouragement in the gospel. Just like we talked about with our brother Pernay this morning. So be encouraged that God is working in me. He's working in you through the one who is the great conqueror, Jesus Christ. Receive this prayer of benediction with me this morning. God, have all our attention now. Continue to captivate our hearts in the wonders of the gospel truth about Jesus. And when trials come, draw our eyes upon your perfect son. Empower and equip us by your Holy Spirit to share the awesome hope we have in Christ Jesus. May our present sufferings in these moments of our lives lead us evermore to him. May these things that hurt temporarily prepare us for the future glory to be revealed in us because of his finishing work. Lord, fill our hearts with rejoicing as we leave this place and go together in the name and the person and the work of Jesus, who is our long-awaited Messiah. Amen. Go with God.